Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to RDI's executive webinar for September. My name is Gordon Dudley, CEO of RDI. It's very uh, nice to welcome you all uh, to this month's session where we're going to be talking about the important topic of uh, attracting the best talents. And we're just making sure that everybody's uh, getting in. And it's great to see that we have uh, people uh, logging into the call from not just in Korea, um, but outside of Korea as well. So welcome once again to our uh, monthly uh, insight session. Um, we have been covering a, a wide range of topics every month. Um, and uh, today's session is also going to be um, following it in that uh, program that we've been running. I know that we might have both HR and non-HR people uh, on the call today, so I'm going to be doing my best to try to cater to all uh, different types of audiences, but I do appreciate that uh, everybody has their own unique circumstances, and so um, as much as we try to provide a, a balanced view, <clears throat> Um, everybody's circumstances are different and so uh, hopefully through questions and some discussion towards the end we can maybe uh, focus in on some of those uh, unique uh, situations that people have. Um, I do uh, want to welcome you to uh, ask any questions uh, that you have uh, throughout the session. Um, we have a, a Q&A function, uh, please, please click that and um, ask any questions you like. If it's something that is relevant to the particular topic at that time, I'll take it um, at that moment. Um, if it's something that is more of a discussion point, we can take that towards the end in the, uh, the Q&A. So once again, welcome, and uh, without further ado, let's, let's get started into today's topic. So uh, our session looks like uh, this. We're going to be uh, focusing on three particular topics. Um, the first, the headline of this session, what are the key factors to attracting the best talent in the world of uh, remote work? I think that regardless of your industry, regardless of your organization size or current status, this is something that is important uh, to everybody um, from, from a company perspective. So um, hopefully there will be uh, lots of uh, good um, food for thought uh, from, from that. Then we're going to get a little bit more uh, precise uh, when it comes to what exactly top talents are looking for in terms of compensation. So um, it's all very well to uh, be able to attract um, top talents, but at the next stage, how are you going to actually make sure that you are able to um, onboard them and bring you, bring them into your organization? So we'll, we'll get a little bit uh, more precise at that point. And like all of our um, webinar sessions, we like to try to make sure that there's something for you to take away. And so uh, the third section um, of this session is going to be what are the new skills that HR professionals need to develop? So in from a perspective of uh, HR as a, as a function, HR professionals, um, what, what is it that you need to be doing to be focusing on going into 2022 and beyond to make sure that uh, you are as effective as possible and also try to enhance the uh, overall performance of the company. So if you're not in the HR function, you're in a leadership role, this could be a good area uh, to have as an agenda uh, with your HR to further enhance what it is exactly they um, can be focusing on from a strategic perspective um, going forward. So. I, I know that uh, most of uh, the people uh, on the call today are already familiar with RDI and, and what we do, but just to give a bit of context as to why exactly we're talking about this, this topic and why it's important to us, I want to just kind of outline the, uh, the three main focus areas that we have at RDI, namely performance management, leadership development, and talent acquisition. And I think these are three important areas that uh, do overlap in, in a lot of ways. And I think that uh, also it's uh, important to say that we will be uh, talking about all of these topics um, throughout, uh, throughout this session. And um, in, in also important how they do relate very much to uh, and interlink to one another. So performance management is something where we are helping um, organizations that are already established um, in, in Korea to enhance their performance um, through professional development programs. 
in terms of leadership development, whether it is first time leaders or very seasoned um, senior managers, um, we provide programs to type to enhance that, especially in the intergenerational context, which is um, an issue uh, for, for people um, across organizations. And then with talent acquisition, our recruiting services, of course, putting the right people in place um, at the, the very uh, first um, part of the process, making sure that you have the right people in the right place. And so that's how collectively our mission to help people work better um, relates to the three areas that, that we focus on. So we're going to be um, mentioning those uh, throughout this session. And, uh, and let's get uh, started with our, with our kind of first topic. I'm going to just uh, start that there. Okay, so what are the key factors to attracting the best talent in the uh, rem uh, remote in the world of remote work? That's the kind of question that we that we posed um, for this session, and I'm going to suggest that you need to be a wind turbine. So these things that we see in the image here, uh, generating wind power wind turbines uh, spinning around and, and uh, creating uh, energy from, from the wind. And I would like to suggest that you should be like a, a wind turbine. And let me explain why I suggest that uh, you should be like uh, a wind turbine. If we want to uh, attract the best talent, then we need to be visible to uh, those talents that we want to attract. We need to be omnipresent. We need to be in every place where they are so that uh, we can be visible and even uh, be, be known uh, to them in order that we can uh, make a connection in order to uh, be able to attract them. And so uh, being omnipresent does not mean being absolutely every possible place. Instead, it means being everywhere that is relevant to the particular talents that you are trying to attract. So in, if you're in a certain industry, there will be certain places, certain channels, certain forums, certain, um, certain areas where they will be uh, most um, uh, kind of uh, present. And that is where you should focus on. And so you will know in your industry um, those places. Perhaps you don't, and maybe that's why one of the reasons that you wanted to join this session to, to learn a bit more. But I think that if you do not know, the first important thing is to find out where exactly those, those talents are and to be present in those. And that's much like the, the wind turbines who uh, remain in place. They are there, they are visible, um, even from a long distance uh, because of their size. The second reason why I think you should be like a wind turbine is because uh, wind turbines are incredibly quick, right? They spin around at incredibly high velocity. And I think that that is a real challenge um, <clears throat> for HR, that um, speed uh, is absolutely um, essential to be able to attract uh, the right talents. Um, we have multiple clients um, across different areas. And one of the biggest um, areas of uh, challenge that they find from being able to attract those talents often is the speed in which they um, run that uh, talent acquisition process. So I'm talking about decision making. I'm talking about feedback. I'm talking about the, uh, the business's decision to uh, be able to um, have a good process and, and move quickly. Otherwise, uh, you will simply lose the ability or the option, the opportunity even to, to um, attract those particular towns. So speed is, is definitely um, uh, another important reason to be, um, to be like that. And thirdly, uh, I think one of the other key characteristics is um, what I would call uh, agility or flexibility. The, the wind turbine, and in this case, if there is uh, just a small amount of wind, will will spin slowly and uh, maximize the uh, the uh, opportunity from what is available. If the wind is incredibly strong and, and hard, that turbine will spin at incredible speed. And I think that agility to uh, to be able to react is also one of the key points that uh, is important to uh, to be. Uh, able to attract the kind of talents that, that you want to attract. So three reasons to be like a, a wind turbine. And I hope that uh, by the end of this session, if there's nothing else uh, that you uh, don't take away, it has at least 
that the thought that you should be like a wind turbine and hopefully if you remember that then you might it might also trigger some other reasons um, how you can be more effective at, at attracting talent so let's develop that case a little bit further and let's go into a bit more detail about what that really means within within the company context and look at uh, the combination of, of factors uh, that are, are needed. What we see in the middle here is the, the golden ticket, the, the, the perfect combination, the, 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 uh, the gold bar there, which is the, the ideal outcome of being able to attract the, uh, the talents that you want. And uh, this uh, can be considered to be a combination of these uh, three factors. Great company, great benefits and great job or great manager. Of course, uh, there is often uh, or incredibly rarely the perfect uh, combination of all three, but I think it's important to recognize that with the omission of one, it will be incredibly difficult to attract the kind of talents that you want to uh, bring on board. And whilst every individual will have different priorities in their own mind about which one is more important, they need to be at least somewhat present um, and um, brought together in combination in order for it to make a smooth um, attraction of that uh, particular talent. Of course, great is a, uh, a subjective term, and we'll talk a bit more about what exactly that means uh, when we say a great company or great benefits in the eyes of the uh, talent that you are trying to attract. So, in terms of great benefits, what, what kind of things could that mean? Um, well, uh, progressive. So uh, benefits might, uh, at the point of uh, joining a company, might be um, of a certain type and a certain uh, quantity, but there should be some form of progression, um, whether that is differentiating by um, seniority, uh, whether it is uh, differentiating by function or any other kind of measure within the company to make them uh, more attractive uh, to, uh, to talents. They should also be customizable. And I think a lot of HR professionals kind of scratch their heads around. It would seem to be rather costly or complicated if we want to give a customized um, set of benefits to to it to all our employees and uh, new new uh, talents but it's really about having the choice and it's clear from research that certain benefits are more attractive uh, than others to uh, every individual if you were talking about having the absolutely fantastic uh, uh, daycare for employee kids um, on site uh, in in your uh, in your company location, then somebody who uh, does not have any kids or uh, is of course going to deprioritize that and is not not going to find that as attractive. So, being able to customize by having choice can do a, a lot to make uh, the benefits seem more attractive, and of course, knowing in fact what. Uh, is important to that person and allows you to customize to them, um, which is even more effective. Uh, talent matching. Of course, uh, certain uh, industries uh, require certain types of benefits, others uh, require different. It was great to see um, one particular company um, offer an additional benefit of being able to provide hardware uh, for their uh, home working employees to those particular uh, uh, employees, so extra screens uh, for them to be able to equip themselves at home office. You know, if that's something um, that is relevant to your particular organization, um, then that is also an important factor. Diverse um, is, is again uh, related to uh, customizable, um, but just having a sheer variety uh, will allow uh, people to feel that it is more attractive um, to be able to get it exactly what it is they want. And then finally, competitive. So um, a level of benefit which is competitive according to the local market, according to that person's uh, particular uh, background or, um, or, or level within the company. 
When it comes to great job or great manager, those, those two come together because the work that you do and the people that you work with um, really are, are part of the same kind of factor. So um, a list of the uh, most ideal type of characteristics for a, a great manager. Um, a lot of the relationship with manager is also about uh, how how that work becomes attractive to to people, and so meaningful work is definitely one of the important things that we'll we'll talk about later. And and then great company. So you know maybe you feel if you're not the CEO or the or the business owner, you don't really have a lot of leeway on this great company factor. It is what it is. The the brand. Um, has been in existence, your products are not chosen by you, but at least the way in which they are positioned, the way in which they are communicated, localized perhaps, can be some of the great factors which are uh, available to you as, as HR professionals, whether you're in Korea or, or around the world. So with that background in mind, what are kind of the levers that we might be able to use to actually affect some kind of change and attract those talents. When it comes to benefits, of course, that's looking at CMB, compensation benefits, as well as talent acquisition, TA. Those are the two factors, whether those are, if you're in a large organization and you have a specific team allocated to that area, you know, they are going to be doing um, the focus on, on that particular area. If um, it is collected um, in, in, a, in a single um, HR representative, of course, um, there is an aspect of, of them uh, that they can look at. When it comes to the great job, great manager aspect, this is about leadership development, of course. And so um, making sure that there is uh, the cultivation of good leaders, as well as the uh, uh, promotion of a good leadership culture within the company um, is, is very important to help that um, also be uh, promoted. And then when it comes to great company, perhaps the factor that on the face of it you felt was an area that you don't have a lot of air, uh, kind of effect on, at least as, as HR professionals, we have employer branding as the uh, kind of uh, candidate talent facing um, communication mechanism to be able to better translate what is uh, our company? Why is it an attractive place to work? Why is it uh, a place that you would want to uh, come and join? And so employer branding, I think, is a, an overlooked area on the whole, um, perhaps even more so in, in Korea. But I think given this new um, pandemic uh, situation since last year, employer branding, uh, because people are experiencing companies on a remote basis, has become uh, more important than, than ever before. And the companies that are really succeeding are the ones who are focusing on their employer branding, getting recognized as a great place to work, um, bolstering their um, uh, uh, ratings and reviews um, as the, the outward communication piece around their, their company. So um, that is uh, the, the kind of the, the, the ideal combination of, of factors, which of course uh, varies according to, to each particular uh, person. But I think um, having each of those different areas to work with at least gives us um, a, a long list of, of areas that we can work on to be able to try to attract uh, the, best, the best talents. So let's move on to the, uh, the second uh, main topic of, of this particular session now, which is, what are top talents looking for in terms of compensation? So we've talked about the background of combining those, those three factors, but at least uh, it would seem that uh, for most people, or at least the perception is this, that money is the most important thing. Um, and that's often what we talk about specifically when we're talking about compensation. But of course, the reality is, is that it's so much more than just, uh, just money. And in fact, that money is something that is um, a value uh, in the perception of the person who um, is evaluating that, a relative term, right? So what is considered satisfactory compensation to one person could be vastly different to another. That uh, 
uh, is a combination of their own background, their own status, their expectations, and many other factors that go into that. And that really sets the bar for what can be considered um, a satisfactory compensation that would be enough to be able to attract that particular talent. If we look at it in specific terms, then that satisfaction is a, uh, a product of the expectations um, versus, the, versus the outcome. So with an expected outcome, um, the expectations will really set that uh, level of um, satisfaction. And that is something that is perhaps uh, the key to companies who think, oh, we, we don't have the budget to pay top of market. We don't have the, the deep pockets of, a, of the largest company or um, a, another company making a lot more profit. We feel much more restricted in that. And that's where I want to give at, at least some good news message that, uh, that the um, idea of what is uh, a satisfactory compensation is in the eye of the beholder, the, the talent that you're trying to attract. And therefore, that if uh, you can uh, provide ways to uh, to match those expectations, then you will you will succeed. And there are definitely some key factors that will change those expectations. MIT Sloan suggested a, a top ten elements of culture that matter most to employees. Um, I guess that the background to say is that. If you were to have your dream job that absolutely was everything you ever wanted, you would maybe even do that for free, right? So in an ideal scenario, the thing which you are doing for work is, is so fulfilling to you that you don't even feel that you need to get paid to do it because you enjoy it so much. That's, of course, the extreme case, um, but there is, a, there is a scale. And so that is where companies who uh, can be aware of this can still, even if they uh, are not able to offer absolute top of market uh, salaries, can use other factors to, to um, attract the right kinds of talents. So the top 10 um, are listed here um, in, in these bubbles. They are to a certain extent all uh, part of the uh, company culture that uh, each organization has, they all um, you know, have inputs and effects on, on one another. The one that is uh, by far and away the most important, the, the kind of the core is, is feeling respected. And that's, that's why it's at the, the center of the, the diagram there, because uh, that is what um, is ultimately for uh, every person at the core of their, um, their being, uh, the most important thing is that if they do not have respect uh, for themselves, then uh, they are not going to uh, want to continue um, staying at the organization and they're, they're not going to want to uh, join that, that particular organization. And so, so what does that really look like um, on, a, on a kind of industry breakdown? I think one of the key differentiating factors is the uh, percentage of the company's uh, 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 frontline operational customer service or um, semi-skilled workers. And so uh, the correlation that we see here between uh, the, the green yellow type of industries, uh, such as management consulting, consumer goods, electrical equipment, these are industries uh, which have a, the highest uh, percentage of professional workers within their organizations. And we can see that they are generally uh, more positive about the amount of respect that they have, that they feel that they are respected within, within their uh, organizations and that they don't uh, frequently discuss it. So it's not, uh, it, it's not a, an important matter at the forefront of, of them uh, in, the, in their mindset. Whereas as we move down uh, to the bottom right side of, of the graph, we can see other industries such as general retail, grocery stores, supply chain logistics, these kind of areas that have a, a higher uh, level of, of non-professional workers. 
for them. Um, respect in the workplace is frequently discussed and it is also uh, relatively negative. And so that's something, depending on your organization structure and makeup, you want to, uh, to, to have a look at. Uh, if you are uh, you know, a manufacturing company with, with a lot of um, factory-based uh, workers, then this is something that um, uh, is going to be more important for you um, compared to some other industries. So it's interesting to see um, that kind of split across different uh, industries there. So I talked about how uh, people can perceive compensation to be uh, relatively high or low according to their expectations. And this piece of research shows that nine out of 10 people are willing to earn less money to do more meaningful work. That is to say that as, as long as they are feeling fulfilled and doing meaningful work, feeling respected in the workplace, that the, uh, the level of compensation is not so critical for them. They are more willing to be flexible on these particular items. And so this is a, a non-financial uh, lever that companies have that they can use to uh, more readily attract the kind of talents that they need to do. Also, I think a very important uh, uh, matter to, to raise here is that previous pay, previous salary does not matter. I get asked uh, uh, too frequently um, here in, in Korea for uh, being able to provide proof of the, the, the previous pay slips of um, a candidate's um, uh, pay history and companies then do their utmost to try to uh, minimize their offer according to that previous pay without necessarily taking into account whether that person felt that that pay was high or low, no, or, no, also not asking them what exactly is important to them and understanding what their priorities are. On the other hand, um, there are organizations who simply do everything uh, internally. They understand the value of the uh, work that they are looking to uh, achieve from any particular uh, person they are trying to hire. They quantify that in, in terms of the, uh, the appropriate salary for delivering that value, and then they make um, an offer uh, around that uh, around that around that level and it is uh, detached from the previous uh, salary level they they do not even um, ask for that because there can be so many other external factors that affect uh, the, uh, the the level of of pay in people um, in in their previous history which are really not relevant uh, according to your evaluation of that talent how attractive they are to you and the value of the work that you want to uh, have them do in, in your organization. So that uh, I think is hopefully some uh, useful food for thought uh, in, in that particular area when it comes to uh, compensation. I think that um, now we want to look at some of the uh, new skills that um, HR professionals uh, should be developing. Um, in order that we can further enhance the overall company performance and be able to attract the kind of talents that we want to uh, bring on board. So what are the new skills that HR professionals need to develop? What, what are some of the uh, tools uh, that we can use um, in HR to, to better uh, uh, enhance the talent attraction? I want to uh, formulate that into two particular areas. One is at a business level and one is at a personal level. And so I, I have um, put together three of each, the first of which is um, the, the business level uh, skills or uh, business level focus points that, that we need to look at. And so the first is uh, a marketing based approach. If we look back to the uh, omnipresence of uh, those wind turbines and having um, a, uh, a talent attraction process, which means that you are uh, visible and present in the places that you want to be for your particular talents, then uh, we can call this a marketing-based approach. 
instead of a kind of uh, push uh, a tactic where you, you reach out and try to uh, target a particular talent, you become a magnet. So a pull, uh, a pull strategy, which is uh, cultivated by a marketing-based approach, specifically uh, employer branding as a, as a part of that. And that will just simply become a, a positive ROI um, for your organization um, to make the talent uh, acquisition process uh, more cost effective. The companies that um, are trying to attract talents who already are incredibly aspirational, who have done all of those things by uh, being uh, recognized as good, great places to work, uh, are inundated with uh, applications uh, for, for any position that they put up and also have the luxury to be much more flexible uh, on the compensation side of things. So that is a, a really um, much more, I mean, if we talk about uh, making life easy for HR, that is absolutely the, the where we want to be and the, the kind of conditions that we want to create. I think business alignment would be the second uh, important thing. I think that uh, in this remote world of work that we find ourselves, which is clearly not going to uh, change, we're not, we're not going to have a sudden switch back to how things were in, in 2019 and before, uh, that the, the HR function really needs to be more than ever uh, aligned to the business. So in large organizations, that means actually being um, allocated to uh, the different business areas. In smaller organizations, that means just being fully um, uh, aware and aligned and aware of the needs of the business. So that in fact, rather than uh, you know, HR being this kind of um, uh, separate, isolated business function, it's integrated with the business. And I think a way to achieve that, uh, if you are not in an organization that's large enough to have distinct uh, HRBPs um, allocated to business areas in small organizations, then simply uh, a, a shift toward of the responsibility to uh, senior managers, those who are hiring managers, who those who are seeking to gain and uh, onboard talents, rather than it being um, a kind of a handover task to HR for it to be a collaborative uh, process um, and getting them more involved in, in that process will give them uh, more responsibility, more ownership, and, uh, and therefore will automatically in, enhance that, uh, that business alignment. The third one uh, that I want to highlight is, is a long term orientation. Of course, you know, we've uh, talked about a lot of ideal cases um, and situations that that could be uh, good and useful for companies. And I think that there has to be a long term orientation, uh, a long term approach to these, you know, starting today, um, making a plan going into uh, next year and beyond to incrementally get towards a better place. Um, it's impossible to change the, uh, the outward uh, you know, perception of, of a company as a, as a good or bad place to work in, in a matter of weeks or months. It's something that evolves over time. And so therefore we should set our expectations to also be like that. I think that if we're going to embark on multiple development projects within, within the HR function, then perhaps uh, the long-term orientation is, is a great way to look at what are the things that are gonna take longer and we start them now and what are some of the quick fixes that we can do um, to make sure that the the business continues in in the best possible way so those those are three i think focus areas um, for hr when uh, integrating into the into the business to enhance the the position of of hr within an organization and then i think the three personal level skills for for hr professionals which i think if uh, focused on can uh, definitely um, lead to a, a better ability to attract uh, more talents, which uh, firstly is uh, tech savvy slash data analytics. And I, and I put that there because as I uh, encounter different HR professionals, I do hear a reluctance, a, a kind of 
um, almost avoidance of uh, the latest technology when it comes to uh, HR tech and systems to be able to enhance their role. I think perhaps traditionally there is a fear that HR deals with sensitive information, that information should be very carefully kept and controlled. And I think that if we go to a, um, a more of an open uh, system where information is shared more freely, then there is a perception that there is some kind of risk uh, around that. Whereas in fact, utilizing the best and latest systems actually gives us more information to be able to better um, work and uh, have visibility of, of talent, to manage talent, um, to um, also work on the leadership development piece as well. So um, that data analytics is something I, I, I know that uh, perhaps many of you in large organizations uh, in the session are thinking, look, I've got legacy systems. I can't do anything about that. Um, so perhaps it's, it's not about changing the systems, but it's about putting in better information from the start at a local level in order to be able to enhance the, the outputs from that. Um, if it were perhaps a talent pipeline, um, then it's about uh, doing a, a, a kind of uh, talent mapping exercise and uh, putting that uh, those potential uh, talents that you want to uh, attract, not tomorrow, not next week, but, but in the long term into the system in order that you can begin a, uh, a process to attract them uh, down the line. The second one uh, that, I, that I have here is interview training. I think uh, a lot of HR professionals are very well versed in interviews. There's something that they do um, on a, a very regular basis. But when it comes to the other people interviewing in organizations, often, even though they have performed a lot of interviews, they might not necessarily know how to interview in the ideal way. They might do it in a uh, rather subjective manner. And especially in this remote world of work, face-to-face -face interviews maybe were more comfortable to, to get a, um, a, a broader picture, but virtually becomes more challenging. So I would really advocate organizations to embark on a program of interview training for any person, any manager who is going to be conducting interviews in order that the process can be better managed in order that the results uh, by being more objective can be enhanced. And ultimately the greatest result is that the, um, the speed of the process is increased because the quality of the decision is uh, made better. And uh, that links back to the overall speed um, of attractiveness as an organization, which is a, a great um, positive outcome from um, having more effective um, interview training. You know, uh, there are some great case studies of companies who lose customers from a poor candidate experience. Um, and that is through the interview process that uh, people have a poor experience they then decide, well, actually, this is not the kind of company that I want to be a customer of. And as a result, they even uh, stop being a customer. So there can be real direct uh, bottom line ROI effects from having a better um, interview process, um, getting involved um, with interview training and um, having that uh, just run much more smoothly and, and uh, effectively. The third one, uh, which is virtual engagement, um, by which we mean the uh, overall engagement level of the organization in a virtual context uh, that we are now working. I think that uh, um, employee surveys, uh, feedback uh, that has been run for the last 18 months is perhaps still under the perception that this is a short term status, that uh, there is somehow a, going to be a jump back to how things were. But the data clearly shows that the overwhelming majority of people uh, now want flexibility and options when it comes to their uh, workplace and working environment. Otherwise, they will consider, seriously consider uh, leaving their job. And so that's something that we as HR professionals have to be aware of going into next year, 
that even as uh, restrictions are, are lifted and the ability to be co-located in offices uh, returns, that in fact, people uh, still want the option to customize to their own situation as to what is ideal for them. And so making sure that um, the uh, engagement of employees through a virtual environment uh, is enhanced is going to uh, continue to be very important. And so it can be um, you know, attacked in lots of different ways. Sometimes it's about going offline because you are together online. Uh, sometimes it's about uh, just getting to know one another better. I think that um, there are now a lot of people in the last 18 months who have onboarded with organizations who have never met one of their colleagues face to face. And so that is incredibly difficult to really know beyond a, uh, you know, a, a virtual meeting sit situation, what those people are really like. And so that is, is something that we also need to work on when it comes to um, HR as well. So those would be my uh, three uh, perf uh, personal level skills, the, the three uh, business level areas as well to, to focus on. Um, I hope that has uh, kind of provoked some uh, food for thought, uh, some areas of, of development um, for you, regardless of your uh, uh, kind of situation or, or status. And as a, as a kind of final uh, stage, I, I want to kind of give you something uh, to kind of go away with and, and keep the conversation going. Firstly, um, I, I want to make a book recommendation. Um, I have been deeply impressed by Erin Meyer, uh, who is um, a, a US-based uh, organizational uh, development and organizational behavior expert who came to prominence with her, uh, her book, The Culture Map, which is an absolutely great book, uh, which I would also recommend about um, cultural differences and uh, effectiveness in a global business environment. But her latest book, which has been co-written with uh, the CEO of uh, Netflix, Reed Hastings, which is called No Rules Rules. So uh, I think that, of course, Netflix is uh, more uh, prominent than ever before. If you uh, were not uh, on Netflix two months ago, you probably now are uh, due to Ordinger or Game, Squid Game, uh, becoming now a, a worldwide hit. Um, the, this book is a, uh, a, a really fascinating insight into the culture and the HR management of Netflix. And I know what you're going to say. We're not a Silicon Valley tech startup. We don't have uh, the same kind of people. We don't have the same kind of resources to be able to do what they've done. We're created differently. And I fully agree. Uh, you, you are created differently. Um, organizations, industries are incredibly diverse. But what I would recommend is that uh, if you take a look at this book and see even just some of the ethos that they have adopted, some of the uh, key points, the key messages that they have, even when it comes to performance management, I think is, would, is really fascinating. And I've even confirmed from uh, some of my local uh, con contacts that that Netflix culture, which they talk about, is even present in Korea. So it's, this is not something that is uh, not a Korean thing. Um, there is um, a lot of opportunity uh, to develop um, in that particular way. So that's, that's a great book to, to, to get stuck into. I fully recommend that. Next, um, something that you can do um, at home or wherever you are at your leisure is take a look at our increasingly large library, library of online resources on our RDI YouTube. So we have um, these series of webinars going up on there. We also have a series of expert invite uh, interviews and other sessions that we've uh, that we've done on there. So please uh, check out RDI Worldwide on YouTube. And um, if um, if you like those videos, then feel free to ask uh, more questions uh, about us. Lastly, on the on the right side there. If you're not already directly connected with me, I'd love to uh, get in touch with you uh, via LinkedIn. Uh, just uh, uh, 
snap that uh, QR code. It will take you straight to my, my LinkedIn profile. I'm more than happy to connect with you and get into more detailed discussions about some of the challenges that you are facing um, in your organization when it comes to attracting the, the best possible talents. So that is the, the end of uh, the, the kind of presentation part. Um, I, and if we do have uh, any questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to, to take them now. Um, if uh, you want to just click the chat, uh, then, then please uh, please type your, your questions in there. Um, alternatively, um, if, if they are kind of specific and very uh, niche to your area, then, then we can, of course, take those um, outside of this, of this particular session and, um, and have them one-on-one, uh, -on -one more than happy to, um, to, to talk uh, to any of you. Thank you, Lauren, for, for sharing the information that our uh, session is going to be uploaded on, on the YouTube uh, channel shortly. Um, so I do invite you to uh, uh, click that. So let's see. We have uh, a few questions uh, lined up here in the, in the Q&A now. So uh, the first question um, that, that's come here is uh, about how can recruiters effectively influence and educate Korean candidates to value company culture as a deciding factor over monetary compensation? That's an interesting uh, question. Um, I would actually argue that uh, Korean candidates are fundamentally the same as, as everybody else, uh, that whilst uh, monetary compensation is um, incredibly important, it is uh, strongly influenced by, um, by company culture. I don't believe that uh, somebody uh, who joins a, a company, even on what they consider to be a really fantastic best uh, salary, but is unhappy from day one, is going to stay there, is going to perform, is going to be an ambassador for the company. So I think that the, uh, the concept of valuing company culture is inherent in everybody. Everybody wants to, uh, uh, you know, enjoy life and uh, feel that they are contributing and adding value. And especially uh, when people feel that they are contributing so much of their life in terms of time um, to their work and to their career, that um, company culture um, is, is incredibly um, important. If the, uh, the question point is specifically about recruiters. Um, if, if we have you know, people who are working either independently or, or in-house, I think that um, the, the way to, that we do that is to simply ask the questions, what is important to you? And you can, from understanding a candidate, uh, under, uh, you know, get a sense of what is, um, uh, the, the important factors, um, what really drives them. Yes, uh, money is important, but, but what else um, is it that, that makes them happy? Um, and, you know, conversely, what makes them unhappy? And that, that would give us a, a lot of good insight um, as well um, to be able to uh, make a balanced view. Another question that's come in is, uh, is remote hiring the way to go even beyond the pandemic? Um, and what are the key ways? Uh, second question is a different topic. So remote hiring is the way to go beyond the pandemic. I think uh, that uh, it does to a certain extent depend on your industry and the type of work. Uh, there, are, there is of course, clearly certain types of work that because it requires such high levels of collaboration are inherently more difficult to do effectively online. So I think on a case by case basis, um, if you uh, uh, are, are able to, to do that particular work uh, as effectively online, then really what is the most uh, uh, cost effective? What is the quickest? what is the, uh, the most uh, rapid way to, to do uh, hiring, 
um, it is, uh, you know, remotely, it, it is um, to, to be able to give the option to people if they want that, um, that's going to ultimately uh, satisfy them um, if they have that option. So um, it, of course, I'm sure there are also a certain percentage of people who really do prefer to be um, office based, co-located with others. And so having that option is also important. I think what we'll see going forward is um, a, uh, a type of increased flexibility um, around companies. Um, which is also not, uh, you know, one person does not choose one kind of work um, the entire time as well. That also evolves. Certain types of work need to be done in a certain way. So people will also change over time. So it's a, it's a constantly evolving thing to, to look at. And a, an, uh, another question here, um, whilst we have just a, a few minutes more, is 80% um, of candidates who have a bad recruitment experience will openly tell others. What proactive measure can HR take to ensure a positive candidate experience other than interview? So the interview, uh, ex the, 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 the kind of experience, um, the candidate experience, the, the, the event is the, is the interview. The process begins from the first point of contact through to the, the final decision. So it's, uh, it's about uh, uh, the, the communication process, uh, being open, being transparent, being timely. I think um, I see so many companies spending weeks to get feedback back to, to candidates uh, when it comes to uh, interviewing and even longer when it comes to making a decision whether to make an offer. So I think that, uh, you know, the uh, changing your job is, is it just inherently stressful time in people's lives. People want to um, reduce uncertainty and make it go as smoothly as possible. And so um, doing it as quickly as possibly in the most transparent way is, is one of the best ways of, of reducing that. I think also um, one thing I saw, which um, some companies are struggling with is um, in the, uh, the candidate uh, uh, experience, literally in the, the way in which the interviews are conducted is also very varied. Um, you know, cases of uh, people being um, interviewed um, with uh, by a panel and nobody has their cameras on. Um, so, you know, you're just talking to, to nobody, you cannot see any faces, um, you know, bad uh, quality uh, connections, um, late uh, for, the, for the start of the interview, all, all these kind of factors um you know create an impression um and so if hr can help their hiring managers and people who are conducting interviews to be as professional as possible and represent the company in the best possible way then that's definitely going to be a really good uh, way to help the the candidate experience as as much as possible um if you want to really uh embark on a on a process of improvement then it would be to also get a direct feedback on that so for every uh of course you you can get feedback very easily from the people that you hire but that's probably going to be positive because you've been able to hire them what you also want to get is the 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 uh the people that you weren't able to attract um so getting uh, feedback from them why uh they felt it was a negative experience is also going to be um, very helpful to improve that particular process. So um, I think that's uh, a, a good uh, range of, of questions that we have had um, across, the, across the, the topics that we've covered today. Um, as we uh, approach the, the, the end of the session, I want to thank everybody for, for joining. Um, I do really appreciate um, you, you being with us on, on the session. We're going to be having more sessions like this coming up. Um, in a couple of weeks time, we're going to be going into even more detail on interviewing. So if that is an area that is of interest to you, then definitely watch out for that coming up. And uh, you know, we will continue with our, with our insight series um, on a monthly basis. Thanks once again, and uh, have a good rest of the day.